Welcome back or welcome to the Strides with Greywell podcast. Today we have a treat. Michael McKillop on the podcast, nine-time world champion, four-time Paralympic champion, and he's even run for Ireland as an able-bodied athlete. Uh, he's he's not only my rival, but become a good friend of mine. And so without further ado, welcome my good friend, Michael McKillop, to the podcast. What's up, How's Mike? How's it going, guys? How are you? How's things? Good, man. Good, man. Doing well. Doing well. How's that? Uh, How's everything in Ireland going? Yeah, things are good. Um, obviously complicated with lockdowns and uh, restrictions and stuff like that, but uh, I'm doing as, as well as you can be. I'm training away and I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy life and um, not get too hung up on whether or not next year will happen or not, but um, I just got to keep my, my head down and, uh, yeah, I'm focused. Yeah, what does uh, what, what, what training been looking like for you right now? Um, we're in base phase at the minute. Um, I was just well, probably we're starting week seven um, of um, winter training. So it's a lot more miles. It's a lot longer uh, reps and kind of fartleks and tempos and stuff. But yeah, for me, um, I'm I, I I'm an open book. I, I don't I don't mind what people know about my training or anything like that. That that for me is a, a given. Um, the only thing that they don't know is how hard I'm working. Um, and I guess that's the, the that all I worry about is uh, I know how hard I'm working. And yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think like you know before going forward, let's let's go back a bit and just give uh, you know everyone a little background on you. So um, you have cerebral palsy, and I believe you were finally. Uh, identified with that when you were just older than two um what what was that like and what was pretty much living your, your entire life with that yeah i think um i got diagnosed at two years and 10 months um but it was a year and 10 months whenever my parents really started to notice that um something wasn't really right with me um i had fallen down the stairs um at a year and 10 months and i was brought to the hospital um, a few weeks later, because they know my parents really started to notice that I was kind of walking with a limp, um, and they noticed that my arm was starting to be like a creeled into a fist position and quite up tight against my chest. Um, and when we went, when they took me to the, to the the doctors, and the consultant just basically said it was a habit. He um, thought that I had uh, basically copied something off the TV, um, like young kids do and that we would just end up getting back to, to normal things. Um, but unfortunately, um, a year and 10 months led into another year of the unknown for my parents. And I think seeing me deteriorate or to get worse um, with obviously out treatment or anything like that or diagnosis. Um, so they got another consultation. Um, and as soon as I walked through that door, two years and 10 months, um, the consultant just turned around to my parents and said, your son's either had a stroke or he's got cerebral palsy. And just like that, um, not only did my life change, but also my parents' life changed. Yeah, yeah, I know for sure. And uh, from uh, what I heard on another podcast, your dad g gave you spikes at five years old. And uh, you have a little bit of background with both parents uh, being athletic. And so what, uh, what was that interest in, or that entrance into track and field like for you? Um, it started so young, and like I said, my parents um, were involved in athletics. Um, my dad ran for Ireland um, as well, and I think whenever I look back, at there was not going to be anything else in my life probably than athletics. Growing up as a young boy, I'd been to watch him race. Um, I'd been to every cross country race in Ireland, and I kind of it was one of the senses that I wanted to basically follow in the footsteps of them um, and I got into athletics when I was probably about the age of 10 um, I did primary school athletics um, and from there I, I did cross country and when I was in kind of younger education I struggled because um, obviously with cerebral palsy it has different effects on people and for me uh, learning difficulties was one of them uh, growing up as a boy and I think it's that was my level, level playing field because I knew I was good at running. I was good at sport. So I could compete against my classmates doing sport, um, but whereas I couldn't have done in the classroom. But um, that gave me that little bit of excitement of winning a race and being the best. 
Um, and I guess I took that and, and ran with it as such, forgive my pun. Um, and yeah, it's led me to, to have such an amazing life and an amazing career. Yeah, I know nine world titles and four Paralympic titles. Wow, that's uh, that's something to be really proud of. Um, do you, obviously, in your nine world titles, was there one that was the hardest that you looked back and was like, man, like that, like I overcame a lot and uh, that one's extra special? Yeah, I think probably world title in 2017 um, in London. Um, probably was one of my toughest races, um, and reason being it, I just I just struggled the last couple of years with um, kind of injuries and mental health and all, all sorts of things in the in the years leading up to competitions. But I got through the competitions and I was fine. Um, but it was really one of them ones. I was coming up against the best um, that I had felt. Um, in a number of years, I had Dion obviously in 2017, and he's an amazing athlete. And you had a few on the ones thrown in there as well. And I guess as a, th a T37 competing against T38, it, you're always uh, unsure of what's going to come out of the woodwork. And I think that's para sport in general. Because let's be perfectly honest, in 2017 you didn't exist to me, um, but now you're you're one of the best athletes in in the world. So. For me, para sport is just, it, it's quite strange like that. Uh, you wouldn't get that in able-bodied athletics, but I think that's uh, the ever-changing thing of para sport and why it can become better every single year because you just never know um, the talents out there or people that are unaware of their disability or what the opportunities they have with the disability. But I think 2017 was uh, the race where I really had to dig the deepest. Um, there was heat um, and... The Colombians uh, played a trick or tried to play a trick on me um, and they sent a 400 meter runner out in the heat and um, went through in 53. Um, and then obviously the the Colombian guy in the second heat who was actually a proper 800 meter runner um, qualified for the final. So I guess it was uh, fun and games then. Um, again, it was something I felt very strongly and annoyed at, at the fact that kind of he got away with it. Um, but it's just one of them things that you got to deal with. Yeah, no, I actually remember like watching the prelims and watching this guy go off and I never, like that was the end of it. I had never heard that story and I didn't know that's, that's actually what they were trying to do with you. That's, uh, that's pretty crazy. Never heard of that. Yeah. Um, I, I look back on it now. I came off the track because he dropped obviously out after 400 meters and, um, I automatically thought because at that time it was kind of like I was still unbeaten um, and, and that was my worry. That that was me going into every heat, every race. I just wanted to stay unbeaten. And um, I think in the heats I just write, well, well, he's, he's going to beat me, but it's not a final. Um, and whenever he came through and he just ran straight through 400 metres and straight through on uh, off the track again, I kind of was able to stay relaxing in the moment um, and, and qualified. But I got so annoyed at that moment when I came off the track, I was really, I wanted to put a complaint in, um, but my team manager basically said that it was, wouldn't be any point, um, but so we just left it. Wow, yeah, that is that is crazy. And you mentioned mental health and uh, I think mindfulness goes hand in hand with that. And um, what has your experience been with mental health and do you have any mindful practices that uh, you find that really helps you? Cause I think um, athletes are really exploring that route. It seems like more and more today. And I'm so happy that it's a topic that we're actually talking about. Yeah. Um, ever since probably, probably 2015 or yeah, by 2015 is whenever I kind of, was able to build up a courage um, to speak out and trying to get help at, at that time. But it, it, I, had, I had held it in for many years, probably since 2011, 2012. Um, and yeah, it just got to that point where I needed, I needed help. Um, I had friends when I was younger who had committed suicide. And that was one of my moments where I said, I'm getting close to that point, but I, I couldn't imagine putting my family through um, what 
my friends' families must have went through. And that's where I decided to, to gain help, um, ask for it. And it was probably the best thing that I ever did because I'm able to sit, sit here and, and talk to you um, and tell people about it so that they're aware that it's okay to not feel okay. It's okay that um, life does get a little bit scary at times and we worry about things and we panic about things. But there's always someone there beside you that will help, be able to help you, whether that be a loved one or someone on the street. Um, and, and that is why I feel that mental health is need, it has to be talked about so much more. And I think, again, like you said, for athletes, especially on a podcast like this, I think so many athletes get beat themselves up because nothing goes right for them or something doesn't go right. But people forget about the positives that the process that we all go through and that everyone does have that feeling of negativity, but it's how you deal with that. And I think that's what I've worked on in the last number of years is to accept the negatives because you do have a past, you do feel crap, you feel the negativity, but you just have to let it go. And And I still work on it. I still struggle at times, but hey, that's life. And um, I think I've been dealt uh, a pretty nice card to be able to travel the world and represent my country and, and win medals and being proud. So yeah, I can deal with a little bit of um, mental health issue because I know that I've got people around me that can support me and help me. Yeah, I know that that really rings home. I don't know if I've actually ever said this publicly, but uh, when I was in high school, three of my friends committed suicide within within two months. And I remember like how I remember when I heard heard you talk about that on a different podcast. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily a way we we want to be connected, but you know, I think our careers have uh, have been connected, maybe in ways that we never thought. Um, you know, which is super interesting because I didn't really focus on mental health until I moved to the training center here in, in Victoria. And it's crazy, like how much of an impact actually working with someone uh, does. And, you know, it's uh, I think it allows you to get perspective. Um, and I think that's always been super important for me. And I really think adaptability is something that especially in COVID and I think especially as para athletes were so good with and uh what does adaptability mean to you and have you how have you used that throughout your career uh thus far yeah adaptability or acceptance um and being able to accept what life throws at you and how you deal with it and, and what avenue you go down or what path you take and things like that and um i've talked obviously about uh, being born with a disability and having the side effects obviously of um the likes of my learning difficulties and speech problems but I've had many other things, like I have epilepsy as well that not many people know about and that, that affects me when I train and um, I can't train to this, the same intensity as a lot of able-bodied athletes and I'm on medication that affects lots of other things in my life but um, I, I just have to accept it. I can't change that. That's just how life is um, and how I adapt that is I work with my dad, who's my coach, and I work with my strength and conditioning coaches. I work with my nutritionist. I work with my wife, um, who helped me to allow me to train to the the highest quality that I that I'm able to do so without putting my health at risk. Um, and yeah, I think whenever it comes around to my age now, dealing with my disability at my age. Um, I break down a lot easier, um, and I've seen that over the last number of years. I don't recover as quickly. Um, my performances are probably not always going up like they used to. Um, there's a little bit of irregularity in them, um, but I just got to take the good races as they're good and take the bad ones and throw them in the bin and move forward, and I think that's what a lot of people kind of don't do um, and they look at the negative first before they look at a positive and I've done that in the past I've always, and that's why probably I got myself into such a state um, but I've learned from that and I think uh, a lot of people can do that with acceptance and and um, yeah I think if anyone can accept it, life as a way it comes, then the world obviously will be a much better place.
Yeah, no, and it's funny. Like I obviously you hear everyone say trust the process, and I always thought that was so phony until like 18, 18 months ago. And you just have these bloops on on one or the other side of it, and really that's kind of how you have to look at it and look at it as just like how do I get better each day? And I feel like sometimes it's hard in the moment to look at that, especially when something's not going the way the way you want it. But then like a week later, something good will happen. You're like, dang, like. Like, yeah, like it does, it is a cyclical kind of cycle. Um, and, it, and it's funny the the way that can be. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, like, for example, obviously you can, I talked about races like last season, track season. Um, I ran one race, my first race of the season. I obviously hadn't raced since World Champs in, in uh, November 2019. And, um, it was absolutely horrendous, but the next week I ran the quickest 800 meters I had in, in three years. So it, it's just one of them things. And I think athletics is such a good thing that allows you to kind of figure out that you can put the bad stuff in the past and, and look to the, the positives. Um, obviously, not everyone is in athletics and doesn't get to see that um, feeling or have that sense. But... I guess I'm I'm in a lucky position the same as you. Um that you could probably say the same thing because not every training day is pretty. Um, but it's just being able to take the positives out of the, the crappy days um and just put, put them put them to the side and move forward. Yeah, I definitely I always live by Kobe Bryant's quote. It says, uh, sports is the greatest metaphor for life. And you know, that's 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 something that uh for for good or for bad that I'm going through, I I, I always say that. And uh, now let's transition a little bit to able body sport because you and I, once again, connected that we really like to compete in able body sport because personally for me, it is I never want to cap my growth. Um, I want to be challenged as much as I can and um, uh, I get challenged in the para scene, but I also get um, even more challenged in the able body scene. What was your thought process into doing able body races? And uh, how has that brought the best out in you, do you think? I think um, it obviously started with my, my attitude to my parents. And it started when I was a really young kid. Um, and you say about Kobe Bryant's uh, quote there, um, I have a quote of my own. And it's, you accept the conditions as they exist, or you accept the responsibility for changing them. And I think that's really what my parents were given. Um, they didn't want a disabled child. Um, they were given that disabled child, and they had to deal with it. And the one way they did it was give me really a lot of opportunities and they threw me into able-bodied life. I went to an able-bodied primary school. Um, I went to an able-bodied secondary school and grammar school. And for me, that, that was where I learned to just get on with it. And there was no disability sport. That I didn't go to a, a disabled summer camp I didn't go to anything like that so it was if I wanted to be good at something I had to compete against able-bodied people and um, I remember primary school I'm on my first ever cross-country race I was Northern Ireland primary school cross-country champion um, and, and that for me was my, the starter for 10 as I would say um, and then it just escalated um, my dad was my coach when I was from 10 11 years of age and I, I joined the school athletics team um, that my dad was the coach of. And I every single day I trained with my able-bodied classmates. I raced against the able-bodied people my whole life. And I personally think, too, obviously last year when you beat me and, and uh, Dion beat me and, and, and the Algerian guy beat me. But up until that moment, and I've seen it over the last number of years of how para sports moved on. I would say it is... I was successful because I trained, raced, and acted like an able-bodied athlete. And I think that's where para sport is now catching up. And it's the likes of you that comes in off an able-bodied livelihood, an able-bodied track cross-country team in your school, and you're seeing now performances that are exceptional. And you can see that through so many different events in para sport. You look at Jason Smith, he's been to the World um, Track and Field Championships. 
He's been in the same heat as Tyson Gay. He's he, like these are these are performances and athletes that are in the able-bodied system, and you're now starting to see that in a more common or a more um, regular uh, occurrence at para events. You're seeing athletes that are genuinely as good as able-bodied people, um, and that for me is probably why I was so successful early on in my career. It was because I was put up against it every single day in training. And I think you, you'll say the same thing. Whenever you train against guys that are better than you, you're going to be improved. You're going to make yourself better. And, and, and that's where I think that's why I performed at the level above everybody else. Um, I'm not saying that I, yeah, I, I won medals, but I would never say I'm, I'm better than anyone in terms of as a person. But I just feel that that's where my... I think my athletics excelled and my performances in para sport excelled. Like I was only 18 when I went to my first para games. I was only 16 when I first won my first ever world title. So from an early age, you, you could see that training with, and racing able body people was that, that moment of it works, but you hadn't seen that in para sport yet. And now you're starting to see it, which is, which for me, shows that para sport has moved on and that we're starting to see elite uh, athletics rather than disabled athletics as as people used to call it. Yeah, man, J- man, Jason can fly. I remember watching him live for the first time, right? I've had never had the opportunity to see him uh, race and that was that was that was really cool and uh, you know the theme obviously in in your answer was high performance and um, was there a certain time when you kind of saw that page starting to turn, maybe not for the athletes, but just for the general public understanding that we are high performance athletes. We are elite athletes. Um, yeah. Have you, was there a distinct kind of page turn or was it, uh, or did it just kind of happen? Um, I think from such an, an early age, and I'll be perfectly honest, uh, the sports Institute of Ireland, uh, sport Ireland and, and uh, sports Institute, Northern Ireland as well. Uh, they're, they're amazing because they treat, all athletes equal, and that doesn't happen in every country. And I, I'm fully aware of some countries that do not do that. But I get the same funding as as an Olympic athlete from Ireland that has won medals or is on the verge of winning medals um, on the elite program. So for me, I feel very lucky from an early age. I was backed. I was given that opportunity. I was treated like an elite athlete. I felt like an elite athlete. But the only difference is the general public weren't aware of para sport. They weren't interested in para sport. So they didn't take me or my performances as seriously as an able body performance. And I think this is where the journey has taken us, that people are now recognizing my performances um, in the past as, as exceptional or on a par with. Again, like I say, it's improving. It's still not there. We need to do more. There, there's, there needs to be an improvement. But I think from 2012, I would say, whenever you're starting to get the like programs in the UK called the last leg, um, was the real sense of trying to bring disabled people or para sport into the public eye, and just seeing Paralympic athletics and para sport in general live on TV and starting to see celebrities classified as disabled people or disabled athletes as celebrities now is, is is cool you've seen the likes of i don't know i don't know about you guys um over in canada but over here in, in the uk and ireland you're starting to see like currently at the minute there's i'm a celebrity get me out of here have no i don't know if you've ever heard of this but there's a girl called holly arnold um and she's a javelin thrower from paralympics gb but she's on a, a program that is with some of uh, GB celebrities like TV hosts and stuff like that. Mo Farah's on it as well. Um, so it, it, it's interesting to see that they're now starting to use disabled athletes as celebrities. And, and I think that's a really good opportunity because it's a platform to tell our story or for Holly to, to tell her story um, and, and get people aware that we, we, we compete at, at the same level as, as the able body athletes. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Yeah, no, that's that's so awesome to hear that that's going on. And obviously, um, we don't have to talk about this if you don't want to. But I think in our classification, it's um, very interesting because even in some of the podcasts you've been on, and definitely the ones I've been on, um, they talk about yeah, 
like if I saw you walking around, I just wouldn't know you're a Paralympic athlete and our um, injury is quote unquote invisible to maybe the general public. Um, and like, what, what has your experience been, been with that? And has that been frustrating at times? Yeah, I think it's very frustrating. And I think it, it's, you lose out on opportunities. Let's be perfectly honest. Prime example, and I use them all the time, Jason Smith. Prime example, fastest Paralympian on this planet, has ran for Ireland Able Body World Championships. Why is he not the face of every single Paralympic Games? World Champion Athletics, you don't see it. But you see guys that have amputated arms, amputated legs, that are in a wheelchair. They're more prominent to the front of para sport. It has to be said, it's genuine. Because let's be perfectly honest, are you going to be the face next year of Tokyo twenty of Tokyo twenty twenty one? No, you won't, because you look able bodied. Sadly, that that that's how it is. That's just the general because people see parasport as superheroes or or, or kind of people with bionic legs and bionic arms. And I know I know that's really hard to say, and it's just the truthful, honest opinion that. Not only me, but a lot of other athletes within para sport think. Um, and I think saying on a podcast with another Paralympic athlete that hasn't got that disability or doesn't have that visual, really impactful thing, I think you, you I've lost out on opportunities. Um, obviously, with sponsorships and, and things like that. But that, again, that's that's how it is. And if that's how people want to to use that then they can do so um i've had success in, in my my career and my parents always growing up because i always at, at a time i always had that bit of uh, do you know what frustration and annoyance why is she getting ahead of me or why is he getting ahead of me whenever actually in fact i'm way more successful i've brought home more medals and things like that and you always think and you always go and, and you you come across like a greedy or a brat as we call it here um but now I've just accepted it as that's how it's going to be. That's the way it is. Um, I've been lucky and blessed that I've had the opportunities I've had. And my, my parents have always said, let your feet do the talking and everything else after it is a bonus. Um, and I've had a good few bonuses in my life. I've, like I said, I've had opportunities. But I think you would agree that there isn't as many opportunities for guys like me and you and Jason and things that because we do not look impactful as some of the other athletes in, in, in para sport. Yeah, no, I had like an episode recently where I just kind of like lost it um, and called my mother and um, my mother's kind of always the knock some sense. I mean, she goes, Nate, you know, listen, like your injuries never defined you. Don't let it define you now. And you only need one. It's like there only needs to be one to come along that takes your story. And then boom, because there's been people that just like, Nate, your story isn't worth telling, which I just say, thank you. Uh, on to the next, um, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, I, th I think sometimes they want to give this poor me story. And I'm just like, no, like our story is a story of triumph. Like it's like adversity, adaptability, perseverance. And um, yeah, that's, that's another thing I've kind of noticed that they just want to, they want to pull this poor, this poor me card. I'm like, well, sorry, like I won't say that because no, nothing in my story is poor me yeah no i i think a lot of people have to basically understand how you feel and how you think about your situation or your disability and how you want to convey it to other people and like like you said there's so many sob stories out there i'm sorry i'll correct that because that's a bit rude whenever you say sob stories because everyone's has a right to to feel upset or sad about their disability or their journey or anything like that. But I think not everyone wants to go down that route. And um, I use my disability as an elite tool. And um, that's the way I look at it. Um, it gives me an opportunity to be an elite athlete. I don't see it in anything else. Um, maybe sometimes I, I say to my wife that I can't do certain things because of my disability. But that, that apart from that, that's uh, that that's another thing, um, doing the dishes and stuff. But like, for for me, I think it's a it's one of them things where you just have to ch kind of pick people's uh, own journey as individual, and you can't always put the same paint 
you can't always paint the same painting with the same brush because that, that it's not it's not the same. And, and I think now where like people want to tell your story in a more positive way rather than oh he's got a disability the poor fella he got hit with a golf ball in his back of his head and stuff like that you don't want to hear that yeah that that's a cool kind of thing but you're not your life has moved on so much from that that you i'm sure want to tell people that no actually i'm based at the the canadian institute and i train in an elite group and, and stuff like that and that's what i have wanted to do for the last number of years because i i, I don't really not that I don't really care about my disability because it's a part of me, but it doesn't really define me of, oh, I'm, I'm, I've got disability, I've got cerebral palsy. But yeah. Yeah. Just one of the things. yeah, I know for sure. I'm not going to lie. I do whenever I forget something and my girlfriend tries to, to remind me, I'm like, don't you know I have a hole in my head? Um, and that doesn't always yeah. go <laughs> go on the best, <laughs> but... Uh, but uh, yeah, I always sure. have that built-in excuse when I uh, when I need the teaser about it. But um, now let's kind of go, go jump back to today. Obviously, you and I hope Tokyo 2021 is going to happen. Um, what uh, do you have anything on the schedule in the new year? Obviously, things can get wiped off the schedule really quick. Um, what what does your uh, new year schedule look like, and uh, what are you focusing on uh, right now? um for me uh like i said i'm in a base phase i'm just kind of junk miles and trying to get uh, my endurance up um that's what i've probably lost over the last number of years not having that winter blocks um and hopefully stay injury free at the moment but um paralympics ireland have requested that we don't travel um in 2020 anywhere like for training camps or anything like that ordinarily i would probably be away by now um i'd be in sunnier climate somewhere like that but sadly, I'm not. Um, but I had a, my meeting with uh, the Athletics Northern Ireland um, high performance woman um, last week. And we set out our plans like Tokyo is going ahead. Um, coronavirus doesn't exist in my plans. If, if it does inter interrupt it, then we kind of have to adapt like, like we've, and accept it. Um, but yeah, my plan is to hopefully go to Spain in January um and hopefully have a group of athletes out there um able body athletes that i can train with and just get my head down um and then probably i got probably two more training camps um before going out on a um kind of camp to, to tokyo and then coming into the village from there but that for me is my plan of action really um in the next nine months ten months um but yeah it's uh it's all fun and games and like you said it's an it we don't know no one knows um but if the vaccine does come around um for this covid i, I think we'll be uh we'll be rocking it out on the track um i'm sure and we'll be doing battle um you put up a post um on instagram earlier on just before you came on um and it was me ex uh sharing the the bib numbers or the bib names um, I actually went and uh, oh, look at that! Look at that! That's awesome. That's that. That's what um, I found. Um, and I guess all I can say is there was three guys that beat me that day um, in Dubai in 2019, and that's all I've thought about is trying to beat them three guys in Tokyo. And I, I know you're one of them guys, and I fully accept it. But like we have talked about this. The day before, I'll be chitty chatty, laughing, joking with you, and on the day of the competition, I'll hate you. Yeah. And uh, plain and simple, that's how it, that how it rolls. But as soon as we finish that race and whatever maybe whatever happens in that race, then we become friends again. Like I, I have, I, I've always felt like you have to enjoy it, and you're a part of something bigger than just a race. And I, I think um, for me, my aim, my my task is to to win the best medal possible. Um, I wasn't on a podium in 2019, and that that for me is my goal, my aim, my ambition uh, is to win that race. And whatever will be, will be. And I think uh, obviously for you now that you're number one, you've got a target on your back. I know how that feels. Um, and yeah, it's 
it, it, it's exciting because you, you you have the unknown um and it's weird sensation weird feeling for me now knowing that i have to hit targets i have to try and hit someone's target and it'll be a little bit more exciting next year for me because the pressure's not on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, but for for me, I just I just I just enjoy life. I try and enjoy it as much as possible and not get really too worried, hung up on. Oh God, I I hate my competitors or something like that because that's the furthest away from from what I do. Um, I enjoy everybody's company. I enjoy a bit of a laugh and a joke, and and and, and that for me is. Uh, how, how next year is going to roll. I'm going to enjoy myself, but I'm going to train it so hard to try and win. Yeah, no. And it's, uh, I think that's the only way any of us would want it. Right. Like we're, we're good buddies off the track, but when it, when it becomes on, I always joke around that I get into my, into my grow up mentality and I'm not nice. Um, you know, and that's, that's just how I am, you know, when I, when I hit the track and I've, I've asked this question to 15 or 20, like really high performance athletes. And let's say that mindset is a set of beliefs that you believe in. Um, and what are three beliefs that are really important to you that you think, um, reflect why you've been so successful and, and why are those important, you know, and some of those come from your parents early on or something you've just gathered up along the way. Um, I think the first one would have to be, and I've, I've said it so many times, acceptance. Um, and I think that, for me, has been a major tool in why I've been successful. Um, second one I would probably choose is dogged. Um, in training, uh, like I said, I've I've always had to hang on to people's coattails, always people better than me, um, and I never give up. That's one thing that I never do. Um, I grit my teeth um, and... Probably that's why I enjoyed cross country so much is because it wasn't how fast you were around the track. Um, you didn't have to think of laps. It was, are you going to run hard up this hill? How hard are you going to run off the hill? How hard are you going to run down a hill? How are you going to go through a muddy section? So for me, dogged um, would be a, another one for me. Um, and probably my third is um, probably happy, happiness. Um, because whenever you're happy and you're enjoying yourself, um, you can sing and dance before a race, or you can you can you, you feel a little bit loose. You can you can really really focus on what you're trying to achieve rather than worrying about what is going to go wrong with that. Because let's be perfectly honest, you don't always get a perfect race, um, and it's trying to take all the negatives out of it. So there they would be my three. Definitely, definitely, and. I think I can't talk to you without talking about coffee. Um, and I believe you have a new sponsor. I don't want to screw up their name, so can you say it so uh, so I don't screw it up? Yeah, it's Kimbia Coffee. Um, basically, it's um, it's a Northern Ireland brand. Um, just a startup business from uh, from just a place outside of um, Belfast. Um, and it, ironically, it's came from a running background. Uh, the guys that. Um, Grow the beans in Kenya are past marathon runners, um, but they were a part of a like a a mission um, in Northern Ireland that brought um, Kenyan athletes over to to Ireland to be able to race to earn a, earn a living from from races. Um, so it's now kind of a side section of that. So they've given them an opportunity to you grow the the coffee, we'll buy it off you, and it gives them a living after retirement. And yeah, it's grown up in the, the Great Rift Valley in, in Kenya, where so many successful runners are. Um, and yeah, it it was an amazing opportunity with obviously a, a startup business, and it's always hard, especially in COVID, um, and trying to make something great of it. And I think coffee is is is, is a great opportunity for someone to become successful. And it's it, quite ironic because the guy that actually started the company, um, I raced with his brother um, in that European cross country, IAAF. So he was a teammate of mine. So it was kind of a nice connection there as well. So um, his name's Noel Collins um, and he, he was an exceptional athlete in his day. Um, and yeah, so it, it was a nice opportunity to take on board going into 2021. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Do you have a favorite blend from them that, that you enjoy? Currently, at this minute in time, they have one blend. Um, so, it, like I said, it's very early doors for them, um, and it's an opportunity for them to really 
Um, get into the nitty gritty of how going from just like he's he's roasting them in his garage at the minute. Um, so it, it's a small process, and he he wants to go, go bigger and, and better, but he needs to get the name out there, the brand out there. So thank you for allowing me to mention it on the podcast, because um, it'll be a great help for him. And uh, yeah, I think he's he's made makeups of kind of like packaging and stuff that he wants to be able to to put in the shops. And I've sat down with him to talk about how how we can uh, grow the partnership together and I, i've always made up ideas of i don't know if you've ever heard of park run um no, no it's basically free 5k race every single week on a saturday morning um it, it happens around the world um, and basically anyone can turn up um so joggers walkers people running with their dogs anything like that so um, I've always said that we should pitch up there and, and bring some uh, Kimbia down and give free coffee out just to, to get the name out there. And that's uh, that's an opportunity. Hopefully we can do whenever Park Run and COVID can do one. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, I, I have some rapid fire or not so rapid fire questions for you that I kind of ask, uh, ask all, all my guests. Uh, my first one is if your life was a movie, what would be the title? Uh, oh yeah. Um, uh, that's that's really hard. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. Um, come back to it. I'll come back. Go ask me the next one. I'll come back to that one. Um, favorite quote. Um, if you believe, you will achieve. And that's the one that's on your website, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what's your favorite book or podcast? Or you can give us both. Um, uh, podcast, it would have to be Nick Gray Wolf's uh, podcast. Just recently started up um, and he's had a few guests on it. Um, no, for me, uh, I don't really, to be honest, I don't actually listen to a lot of podcasts. I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, I'm more a music man. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh, book. Um, actually, I'm fascinated with the World War II um, and a lot of kind of like outfits and, and, and the history of the outfits. And the, um, so for me, it would probably have to be based on um, on that um, and, and history. But actually, a good one that my wife just got me for my our wedding anniversary uh, and you will have to read it. Uh, it's basically about the Russian whistleblowers on the anti-doping, um, something that we also feel passionate, very passionate about. Um, so basically, it, I've only read four four chapters, but it's a book basically about um, the two people, the, the anti-doping officer and the 800-meter uh, athlete that basically told the whole story. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really intrigued to, to read more into it, but it just goes to show that we, we potentially next year will be racing against um, Russia. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And obviously we we'll, leave it, we'll leave it at that. We can't we can't can't say much more than that. <laughs> yes, yes. We don't want to get in too much trouble now, even though that we're both troublemakers. Um uh, my 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 next one is obviously travel is all on our mind right now. What is one destination that you're looking forward to going or you're hoping to go to uh, when this pandemic is over? Obviously, we have um, training camps to go to in Spain and Portugal. Um, obviously, Tokyo will be a major one in there, and I'm really excited to go there. Um, it, it's a country I've always wanted to go to. I'm into my technology and tech stuff, so being able to go there and, and seeing the, the future things because they're always like six months to a year ahead of everybody else. So uh, I'm excited to go to Tokyo. But for me, um, I was in Australia last year, um, visiting Nicole and my wife's um, cousin down there in Perth um, and 100% that's where I'm going after after Tokyo. I'm going back down to see David um, and, and his wife and his kids and, and, and just basically chill out, relax because we didn't have a holiday this year. That's where we were meant to be um, in uh, pretty much now. We were meant to be in Australia at this minute, but um, it's just one of the things that COVID has restricted us from 
So yeah, absolutely. And my last one is obviously you said you're uh, big, big into music. Can you give us a couple of your favorite artists um, that you listen to? Just chilling. Chilling. Um, probably one that's kind of out there would be a little bit of Stormzy. I, I, I'm not going to say that I'm a massive fan of Stormzy, but I do listen to some of his music. Um, he's a British rapper, um, songwriter. Um, and then I'll go kind of completely left field and you'll have never heard of the man before he's an irish artist and he's called paul paul brady he, he's an irish folk um kind of singer um I, I, I like it doesn't matter what genre of music it is i i love it all um and my third probably um you can't go far wrong than uh, again you this will be cliche and everyone will go Choose one song. I'll pick it. Brian Adams. Um, he's a favorite of mine. Um, I went to see him. It was a dream come true going to see him. Um, and everyone will go, oh, summer '69. Uh, but yeah, um, I listened to him whenever I was like 10 years of age. Um, my uncle, who sadly he just passed on last Thursday, um, he was the one that introduced me to Brian Adams, and that's why probably it's so special that I that I listen to it now. So they would be my three. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I asked two final questions to all my guests. Uh, first, where can everyone find you? Oh, they can find me on all social media platforms. Um, tagline at Team McKillop. Um, and again, you can find me on my website at www.michaelmckillop.co.uk. Um, and yeah, if you flick through my website, you can uh, have an opportunity to find out a little bit more about me and, and my team um and uh and, and my journey and to where i am now so yeah awesome and lastly uh what do you want your impact to be on the world uh ooh. i want people to understand that life is a one chance opportunity and to take it as it comes and to enjoy it as much as possible and to accept all the negatives and accept all the positives and make it the best possible life. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It was so much fun to catch up. It's been a minute and uh, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time, my man. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Anytime. Cheers.